my name is Gravenikov Roman, and I will tell you a couple of uh, horror stories about case classes, and that they are not free. Uh, I currently work at a company called Findify, and we do uh, search and recommendations for e-commerce, and there are some problems with this. So it's not just a static recommendations or a static search. It's changing online while the inventory of a merchant changes. It's large scale. We have a couple of thousands of merchants running with it. And the search results and recommendation results are different for different people depending on their past behavior on a merchant website. And to train different machine learning models fast, you need to store a lot of user behavioral data information close to your machine learning model, and we usually store it in RAM. And this one can be a bit tricky if you have a lot of users. So if you have just a thousand of one of users, well, that's fine. You can store everything as you wish. When you, when you have one million of them, there can be uh, some problems. And these problems usually can be solved. Let's just set a 32 or 64 gigabyte heap for our application, whatever it costs, and see what happens. Uh, it might happen that your garbage collector will start behaving weirdly, or your application throughput will go down, and it's operationally more costly, because if you're a small startup uh, buying a 32 gigabyte RAM machine on Amazon, which is uh, quite pricey. Uh, and um, usually the story of the data modeling um, starts with the case classes. So example, a short example, we have a page view, which is just a simple case class with an ID, some ID, it doesn't matter what, and the time, which is timestamp, which is long, and a short quiz. So we have an instance of this case class, like a page view, and how much of a precious RAM it uses. So we have a couple of options here, and we have to vote. To, I'm from Russia, we like democracy and voting, you know. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, and uh, I will give you some hints, and some of them will be correct, some of them will be incorrect. So a page view is a class, it's a Java uh, GVM class. Uh, it has some sort of header, and we know that this uh, four-byte character string, it can be either four-byte or eight-byte, depending on the Java version. Um, we also have some eight bytes for page views, so maybe it's close to 24 bytes. Who's voting for 24? No, we can raise your hand if, you're, if you wish. No one. Ah, there is a single one, optimistic person, the most optimistic person in um, the whole. Uh, the, Okay, but we forgot that uh, the string itself is also an object, so you cannot plug ob object to object. You need to store a reference to that object. And this object also has a header, so maybe it's uh, 48 bytes, the second one, who's voting for 48. Oh, there is also 48. So, but um, the character array inside of the string is also an object, so we need a reference to the character array. For array, we need to have a length, and maybe it's 72 bytes. Who's voting for 72? Oh, that's much more. Uh, and we forgot about object padding, because if we run on x64 architecture, your memory, uh, your objects on the memory should be padded into double word alignments, so there can be holes between an objects. So maybe someone is going to vote for 96. Yeah. So the, m the major part of 96. And for this particular instance, it's 72, but if you add uh, one more character there, it will be 96. So it just depends on the, pad on the padding. Um, so, uh, so you see that uh, the case class is not free, and even for a smaller case class, you see that there's a lot of data hidden inside, and you even never see it. And for uh, to deep dive for a case class, we use a tool called uh, Java Object Layout, and there is an SBT plugin for that, uh, so we can do, do like uh, Joel internals uh, page view. What's inside of our page view? And it dumps our, our uh, 
um, how it looks inside for the Java machine. You see that it's 12 bytes for object header. We have a four byte reference for the string object and eight bytes for time. You see we fit the padding, so there is no free space here. So we're not wasting anything. And for the string one, it's a bit different. It depends on the Java machine. It's for Java 8, for Java 9, it will be a bit different. But the story is the same. It's 12 bytes for a header. You have a reference, four byte reference to the array of characters. You have a hash code value. In Java 9, you also have this something here on this uh, object padding thing. And for a character, I don't have an idea how to dump internals of the character array in uh, Joel. But you have to believe me that there is a length and object header and so on. So if we uh, sum it up to us, ah, so it looks like this. So our simple precious page U is a huge and complex structure going deep to your heap. And uh, if you, we sum everything up together in a list of uh, all the stuff, you will see that there is a lot of memory wasted. It's not really wasted, but it's still used and you cannot use it in a more effective way. So for our case class overhead, it's like almost 80%, which is very disappointing. But if you try to use a collection of case classes, you also might know that 80% is still fine, it can be worse. So for the collection of case classes, it's just a simple, very simplified definition of list in Scala. So it's, the list itself is a case class with two references to the head and to the tail, which itself is an object with padding, with references, and so on. So it looks like this, it's a very, complex structure referencing to each other, and all your objects are distributed not completely randomly over the heap, but they are not sequential. So uh, we can uh, play a bit with the memory usage of our page object, but in a more high level way. So we'll have a list of uh, one million page views and uh, try to track a memory usage of the whole object of list with all these uh, elements going down. But for this, we don't want to use the Java object layout because it's too low level. There is also a uh, gem. It's a Java agent for memory measurements. It's a tool can be used to measure, uh, to measure a memory used by an object and all the objects which are referenced by this object. It just measures, it traverses the whole tree of references in Java virtual machine. And it's not that hard, actually. So we'll try to use it in a, this way. So. Uh, We'll try to measure just function hello. I will just think maybe it's, it's better. So it's 56 bytes for the hello uh, thing. The measure function is just calling the gem uh, function to measure the object layout. There's nothing, not, nothing special here. And then we are going to have a, um, measure a list. Uh, list of integers uh, like this. So you see that it's almost uh, 40, uh, kilo, uh, 40 bytes per integer, which is also only four bytes. For our uh, page view, it will be also that bad. So like page view, like i to string. I hope it will compile. Yeah, so it's 96 bytes per element, which is quite a lot. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> if we see how uh, the memory usage per number of elements converges, we see that it converts to 96 bytes per page view, which is a lot. And for, collect for different types of collections, the convergence point is a bit different. It's for primitive, for integer value. So it sees that it's a bit better for vectors, it's a bit worse for list. It's very weird for set at the beginning. You can go on the implementation of set and Scala to understand why it's happening. <laughs> uh, but the, the problem that it is happening not because of the Scala library collections implementations. It's the limitation of the managed platform. You cannot escape it. Uh, currently cannot escape it. And let's just jump for a short uh, trip to another world, which is not Scala, not JVM, it's just C++. Don't, don't be scared, it's just a single slide with C++ on the whole presentation. So it's just a 
page view, which has also a string and, ID and uh, timestamp, and it's not really a correct way of measuring a page view size uh, in C++, but just for demonstration purposes. But if you see how it is uh, distributed in memory, you'll see that there is no uh, just multiple object references. Your uh, string length is encoded directly to your structure of, a, of the page view. There is a pointer to the number of bytes because it can be variable. And there is time right here. There can be some padding at the bottom, but it's controllable by the compiler flags. And there is almost no, uh, there is no headers, no uh, object references, just perfect, and if you see how like vector implemented this way, it is just everything is packed together. There can be some padding here, depends on your uh, object size and uh, compiler setting, but still it looks like this. And it looks very interesting and acceptable, so it's almost no RAM overhead, your CPU is happy because all the uh, objects are located sequentially, so you can traverse them very quickly. And the question is, can it be implemented within not leaving the managed world? So, and um, the answer is yes, but uh, there are some problems. So there is a project Walhalla, which is um, being developed in some uh, some underground of uh, Oracle headquarters, I have no idea, and the problem that we don't know when it will be released and uh, still some far future, but it will allow to use your value objects as uh, objects and so on, but no one knows what it will went to. So there is a Chronicle map, which is map, but uh, with, it's very Java specific. It has complex API, a ton of boilerplate to use it. It can solve our problems of memory usage, but you need to throw a lot of code for that. Uh, the MapDB, it's also map-only, it's uh, mostly focused on persistence, and it's written in Kotlin, and for some reason it cannot be used inside Scala, because of some bug in, Scala co in, in Kotlin compiler. And we, we, at least when I tried it last time, a couple of months ago. There is Scala of heap, the main problem that it is not actively maintained anymore. There's Google flood buffers, which does exactly the same thing as we going we, we might use, but it's a code generation which is uh, on Scala. Uh, so it's very disappointing. And uh, what if there was a, uh, a solution that you can plug something to a Scala collection so you can use your interface that you got used to with all this uh, 150 different methods to slice and dice lists and maps. You don't need to write boilerplate. By boilerplate, I mean that if you, you need a way to define how to serialize and deserialize your case classes. And if your application will allow you to do it automatically without writing the code, which will be, it will be great. And for the overhead, it should be not 1,000 times slow because there is no, not acceptable, at least for me. Uh, so uh, at my company, we implemented a small library called Scala Pact, which is an extension to Scala collections, which can transparently encode and decode your case classes uh, to array of bytes. So you, so, but it's just words. Let's have some interesting demo. So we have this, uh, let's have a list of just a regular list. There's a lot of stuff here, and we have a, measure a list and use this two thingy on the collections to change the way it is implemented and there's a, it's just a small hack for a different in memory representation and it was 96 bytes you remember it's it's here so and now it is whoa ah it was a typo and it's 19 bytes page view, and actually nothing changes, so you can have your, uh, uh, you can see with your own eyes, so it's just, uh, the same objects are here, the same ton of methods are here, because it's just the same Scala collections, but the memory usage is different, and uh, it, it looks like this, uh, but, <laughs> But technically, there is uh, a lot of uh, simple things happening under the hood, which can be easily explained. And I'm going to run through all over them. Uh, 
So every, everyone made a photo. Yeah, finally. I can switch the slide. Uh, so for the serialization and deserialization, uh, so it's the, the, the regular way everyone took like writing their own JSON library. Uh, so you have some basic type encoders and decoders, just a way to decode strings, integers, and so on from the base types. And uh, you can use shapeless to derive uh, an encoder and decoder for case class. And uh, so for case class, for our page view, you can uh, represent it as a generic structure. It's not just a page view, it's just a, a H list containing of string and long. And uh, you just iterate over this H list at compile time with shapeless, uh, use the implicit uh, encoders and decoders for string and list to encode everything into a single chunk of bytes and decode them back. Uh, so it's for type classes. But uh, if you're going to use shapeless on some more complex hierarchies of case classes, there are different levels of doom of the um, uh, type class derivation with shapeless. So uh, the, 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 the simplest one the simplest case is uh, when you have just uh, like a page view. You have already encoders and decoders for string and long. You derive a one depending on them. More complex one when you have uh, encoder for string and you don't have an encoder for easy, but you can derive it. So it's kind of recursive. The more complex one when you have uh, um, a type which has a reference to itself. It's like a recursive one. So you need, while decoding the, uh, uh, deriving the type class for that, you need to do it lazily, because otherwise you will be deriving in an indefinite loop. Uh, and the, the nightmare is uh, ADTs. Uh, and if you are going to use shapeless for that, there are the two ways. The manual one, which is a kind of a complex thing, uh, the, there is a less or more automated one and more easy one with this label type class helper. So you just uh, derive, uh, implement just a set of type classes for the end of your list and uh, for head and tail, and it will do all the magic under the hood for you. Uh, you can do it the same for co-products if you wish for do this ADTs, but still. There are still some problems with shapeless uh, when you're trying to use it on production because the first time uh, when I started playing with the library, it was, uh, oh, it works well, but when we migrated to production and we had a case class with 50 fields and some of them were nested types with the other 10 to 15 p uh, fields, uh, it took maybe five to 10 minutes to compile this class, so it can be problematic. Um, the, so, so we switched from shapeless to magnolia. It's just uh, it, you can try it afterwards. Uh, so when you're going to integrate with Scala collections, um, it is not really documented anywhere. But uh, still, uh, if you can read uh, all the hierarchy of Scala collections, you see that you need to implement a builder for your type. So it's just a thing that can. Uh, append elements to your uh, packed list, and it can do it with some other structure, not the packed list uh, directly. It can have some sort of array inside, and then you wrap it up in some specific way, and uh, can build from type class, which is specific to Scala 2.12 collection implementation, because it, the implementation will be different than 2.13. You cannot just easily migrate if you use can build from and uh, after what you just import all that stuff on your um, you just import it and it works sometimes sometimes not uh, so for lists for packed lists we use just an array of bytes and uh, when you uh, add elements to a list uh, with we have this packed uh, list builder. You just dump all the serialized page view data to this list, and that's all. When you uh, just over going to over the buffer, you just expand it, and that's all. Uh, it even works well with primitives, surprisingly, but there still will be a lot of boxing there. Under the hood, it will be serialized directly into integers, so just four bytes, but uh, because you're using the Scala collection interface, the interface is <coughs> generic and it need to do boxing and unboxing passing through this interface. Uh, so in memory, it 
looks like this. So for each uh, page view, we have this page view size, the length of the string, the time here, and no object references, and even no hash code, and all, everything is just packed together as tight as possible. You can pack them with padding if you wish, dependent on the, your performance requirements. Um, uh, I've already occasionally showed you the demo of the list of integers uh, before, so I'll skip it. So for maps, it works in a bit uh, different way. Uh, so Scala maps are tree maps, uh, and they're implemented this way to allow you to quickly and immutably rebuild the whole map if you inject elements there. Uh, I was too lazy to implement tree map with this uh, packed implementation, so it's just a simple open addressing hash map. So it's uh, the offset table. So when you have a page view, you compute a hash code, uh, get the bucket number. Uh, if this bucket is free, you use it, but store not the, uh, the page view itself, like you do it for just a regular open addressing hash map. You uh, store the uh, offset in a buffer when you wrote this object. And to read this object, you uh, get the hash of the key of this map and go to the specific bucket, see the offset, and read from that. So it looks like this. Um, there are still some limitations in this uh, Scala Pact, uh, technically a lot of them. Uh, so it looks like immutable, but uh, if you, as you are serializing everything to a single byte array, uh, so it's really hard to update element in the middle of your byte array. Uh, because if you're immutable, you need to relocate, and uh, you also might need to shift elements in this byte array because your new element can be larger than uh, the whole for this element. Uh, the semantics of the packed list and packed map are a bit different because lists in Scala are, are like li linked lists, and the prepending elements to linked lists is almost free, but it's not, not really free when you have everything serialized into a huge array of bytes. You cannot prepend to the beginning of the buffer because there is no space there. So you can either, and you still need to relocate afterwards. Uh, the same for map, and um, if you are using a very different uh, backend implementation of, based on this back ar uh, array of bytes, you might have some specific hacks for specific methods like uh, length or uh, find to make it more optimized. So if you have an uh, object size encoded into your byte array stream, to have a length, uh, to, to count all the elements, to, to, uh, you don't need to unpack them. You can just uh, scheme over the byte array and the length fields and just count how many objects are there. And um, as I told, it's a lot of boxing happening there, and you cannot easily escape it. Uh, for the benchmarks. So the first one is just a list of integers and it's a RAM memory usage, uh, depending on the number of elements. So you see that uh, packed list is quite good. Uh, this weird spike at the beginning happens uh, for a reason, uh, because we're allocating not a zero length buffer at the beginning, but some, it's 30, it's 128 bytes or something. So it's converged to here. Under, after the 32 elements. Uh, the same happening for vector. Uh, and this interesting spike to the bottom for list is happening because there are separate list implementations for a list of one element, two elements, three elements, and as far as I remember, four. Uh, and uh, that's why it's so effective here, but still behaving quite well. Uh, so for uh, the more complex benchmark of like a sequence of page views for different types, we see that it still behaves quite well. Uh, so it's still better than a vector or a list. Uh, for the performance, uh, when I tried to run all the benchmarks, I was scared that I was, thought that it will be super slow, but surprisingly not. It's a list of integers. I forgot to update the slide. So for a vector, if you filter over a list, you uh, technically building another collection of while applying this filter operation. So you see that uh, filtering over a list is like six something, and packed list is not that slow. Maybe two times slower, but 
uh, considering the memory usage, it may be worth it. For each is not building another collection while iterating, it's just iterating over collection and that's all. Uh, no surprise that uh, packed list is slower here because for vector and list, you don't need to unpack your elements from the byte array. And here you need to unpack them. That's why it's slower, but it's still not dramatically slower. And for maps, uh, it's a map of string to page view or like this. So you see that there is a built 1000 page views map, which is not surprisingly slower than just a regular map because you need to encode all this page views into the array of bytes, but it's not that slow. Uh, looking up an existing element is also a bit slower because of the unpacking. Surprisingly, looking up non-existing element is faster because of the different implementation of the uh, maps. Uh, so open addressing hash map and tree map are algorithmically a bit different. Uh, so what about the okay, real usage of Scala Pact, at least in my company? Uh, no. Uh, because there's like a lot of bugs there in implementation because it's very uh, fragile. Uh, but it was my first deep encounter with shapeless and all this deriving type class magic. And uh, I really like this experience. So uh, <laughs> for the links, uh, the library itself is on GitHub and on Maven Central. You can play with it. The, the tool we used for internals of the keys class you can use in your real keys classes as a part of the OpenGDK, it's Joel. There is an SBT Joel plugin to wrap it into the SBT project and use it like, like, me, like me. And uh, the gem is also on GitHub and on Maven, uh, but it's a Java agent. It requires some specific Java options to, for a virtual machine to start, to load the agent, and then you can use its API. But still, it's very useful. Maybe the gem measurements are not super precise, but it will give you an approximation of your memory usage of your objects you use without any profiler and heap dumps and so on. Uh, so that's all. Uh, I don't know, do we have any time for questions? We have. So I'm the first one who will be able to have questions. Can you use unsafe with it? Uh, technically, yes, but... Uh, <laughs> But why? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the idea was just to have a more compact memory representation, but you still store everything in RAM. You can store it out of the heap, but uh, it's still RAM, and it will have the same memory usage because it's just using unsafe to use an array of bytes and serializing there. Technically, there are different backend implementations in Scalapact, so you can plug and save there. But as and save is, has a questionable future in Java, uh, it's better to still be on, on the managed platform. <laughs>